When I was a very small little girl, I loved animals. By the time I was 10, I knew that I would grow up, go to Africa, live with animals and write books about them. And everybody laughed at me, how would I do that? We didn't have any money, Africa was far away. And I was a girl and back then girls didn't have those opportunities. But I had an amazing mother. And what she said to me is what I like to say to young people all over the world. She used to say, if you really want something, you're going to have to work really hard take advantage of opportunity and never give up. So that was, that was what uh, the advice that I had as a child. And we couldn't afford university. So I actually uh, did secretarial because mom said, well, maybe then you can get a job in Africa. And that's what happened. I was invited out by a school friend, stayed with her, got a job in Nairobi, heard about the late Louis Leakey, and he gave me this incredible opportunity to go and learn about not just any animal, but the one most like us. And of course, when I, when I began, I had no degree. It was very hard to get the money. Uh, it was very hard to get the permission because it was not the sort of thing that was normally done, but Leakey never gave up either. So we got the money just for six months. And it was very obvious that if I didn't see something exciting in that six months, that would be the end. And thank goodness I saw the one chimpanzee who began to lose his fear, David Greybeard, using and making tools to fish for termites. And so that was, that was an observation that according to Lewis Leakey meant we had to redefine man because at that time it was man the tool maker. And he said, well, we either have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. So that, that was it. And over the years, looking back, chimpanzees are so like us and it helps us to better understand ourselves to understand those things we do which have been part of our <clears throat> evolutionary makeup but it's also a platform from which we can say yeah but we're different so what makes us different when I first went to Africa it was 1960 that I began the chimpanzee study and we didn't talk about the environment. We didn't talk about the need for conservation. The chimps lived in what we called the equatorial forest belt, which stretched from Kenya, Uganda, right across to the west coast. And the chimpanzees were probably somewhere between one and two million. And today, maximum 300,000 chimpanzees in patches of forest that are getting always smaller as human populations grow. And there is desperate need for conservation. The only way that conservation can possibly happen in a country like Africa or Asia or anywhere like that is if you have the local people behind you. You've got to have them as your partner. And that was a realization that came to me when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park uh, in, in the early 90s and saw that outside the park all the trees had gone, not just some, it was bare hills. And the people living there, too many for the land to support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, um, cutting down the last trees in their desperate effort to get food for their families. And that's when it, it came to me that we cannot possibly save the chimps if we're not working with the local people. And they have to feel that it's part of who they are and want to help and it's worked so we have this program now in six different African countries in improving the lives of the local people so that they in their turn help us to conserve the chimpanzees and the environment that's their future too when I was traveling around Africa and realizing the plight that chimpanzees were in with forests disappearing I began to learn not only about the problems facing the natural world, but the problems facing the Africans. And it seemed to me a lot of those were driven by the big corporations, multinationals, going into Africa, taking African natural resources, leaving the Africans poorer, just as the colonialists used to do. And therefore I began talking about these things in the developed world. Increasingly, you know, North America, Europe, and then increasingly Asia and Latin America. And everywhere I meant, went, I was finding young people who seemed to have lost hope. And I began talking to them. They all said more or less the same. 
uh, and I'm talking about university students, some of the high school students, young people out in their first jobs perhaps, well, you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. And every time I look at a small child, which is almost every day, and I think how we've harmed the planet since I was that age, I feel desperate, I feel an anger, but is it too late? Are they right that it's too late? Is there nothing that can be done? And I don't know if we're going to be in time to change the course that the planet sadly is on now of destruction. But I believe that if, if more and more people become involved, we still have a chance. And so I began working with young people in 1991 in Tanzania. And it was a program which we called Roots and Shoots because roots, when they start to grow, are very small. But in order to reach water, they can work through rocks and eventually push them aside. And a shoot, even of a, what will become a huge tree, looks so tiny to start with, but to reach the sun, it can work through cracks in a brick wall and eventually knock it down. So if we think of the rocks and the walls as all the bad things we've done to the planet, environmental and social, then Roots and Shoots is hope. Hundreds and thousands of young people around the world can break through and make it a better world for all living things. And so what began in Tanzania with 12 high school students is now a program that's in 136 countries and growing. It's got about 150,000 groups and a group can be in a, in a whole school or it can be two kids but mostly it's somewhere in between, average 40, 50. All ages, preschool right through university with more and more adults taking part. And so basically every group tackles three different projects which they choose. It's a youth-driven program. We don't tell them what to do. We don't give them a box and say, do this and you're a member of Roots and Shoots. No, choose a project for yourself that you care about to help people. Choose one that you care about, or some of you in the group, to help animals, including domestic animals, and choose a project that will help the environment that we all share. And running through this is a theme of let's learn to live in peace and harmony with each other, between cultures, between religions, between nations, but so important between us and the natural world. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people today who understand what's going wrong in the world. And when they think about it, they feel helpless and hopeless. What can one person do? And so they do nothing. They sink into apathy. That's the greatest danger we face is apathy. And the point is that one person alone very seldom can make a huge difference. But we're not alone. There is a growing awareness of what's wrong with the world. We know that our ecological, environmental footprint is too heavy. We know that we're living in a... a unsustainable lifestyles, uh, so many of us. We know that so much of the rest of the world is living in abject poverty. We know our human population numbers are growing. And so we, we feel this, this kind of desperation. But more and more people are aware. And so when we act, when we take small steps in our own individual lives to try and live better, to try and live more sustainably, uh, we're not alone. And when you get hundreds and thousands of people making the right sort of little choices, what do we buy? What do we eat? What do we wear? You know, how do we, how do we behave if we meet a sick uh, animal or a starving child? When you put all this together, it's huge change. So there are some individuals who are so good at passing on this kind of message that just on their own they're making huge change but only because they harness the force that's out there, the force that's everybody who cares.